Welcome to the future where the glass is half full and you'll need new glasses, where you'll be jumping from conclusions. The past is a no, and a new future is born. Never before in history has so much meant so little to so many. AD on the radio. You've got mail. So, did you by any chance? Did you by any you've chance got, watch you've the got mail, debate? Uh, yeah, 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 I got, I got mail. Yeah. Uh, you know, usually I like to blame technical problems that happen on this show on a non-present engineer, <laughs> but in this case, I've evidenced myself as a bit of a knuckle dragger when it comes to the <laughs> digital world because I still use America Online. You know, what's really jacked up. You want to know what's really jacked up? I got uh, my credit card stolen. I don't know. I seem to get my credit card number stolen every couple of years. It's so every couple of months. It seems to be like at least two times a year I got to get a new credit card because I'll get one of those phone calls and be like, did you buy a chicken sandwich from a hot dog vending van in Port St. Lucie, Florida? And I'll be like, no, no, I didn't. They're like, well, then someone appears to have stolen your card. No, no, you don't have to worry about the dollar fifty hot dog, but we're going to have to change everything. And it's such a pain. Oh, my gosh. It's such a freaking pain. And inevitably, there's one bill that I forget to update. You know, like I have to update all my auto pay credit card stuff for electricity and cable and all of these things. And I always forget one thing. And I forgot, I forgot my America Online, which means what? I still pay for America Online. Yeah, uh, still, uh, still. And st- you want to know why? You want to know why? It's you just like and my grandma. Well, yeah, but here's the thing: I'm a I'm a lucky underpants sort of dude when it comes to my trade of radio. I like things to be the same. I like to be able to rely on certain certain things, and I like to count on certain things. Now, unless you have a very long memory, you don't recall this, but. If you pay for America Online, it's free if you just use the web version. But if you pay for America Online, you get to use the America Online program. And there's something about how the emails lay out. When I am sitting in bed prepping for the show, trying to figure out what it is we're going to talk about the next day or later on that day, there's something about the way the program America Online lays out emails that makes it just very user-friendly for me. It's what I've been used to my entire radio career, and I'm unwilling to let it go, which means I still pay, I think, $11 a month for America Online. It's the stupidest financial decision ever. Bearing in mind the year that I got on America Online as a kid, I I, I have to, because it, it was my first email address. That's the other thing. I moved around so much. Like, I didn't have a fixed abode when I got my first America Online account. I was at my parents' house, and then I was on tour, and then I did all this stuff. And so, it, that and my my New York phone number on my cell phone are the only constants I've had in my life for the past decade, and I'm unwilling to let them go. So there I am, like an idiot, making a very, very poor financial decision, and that poor financial decision is paying, not just being on America Online, but paying like $11 a month for the privilege of being on America Online. It's not the most fiscally nimble or intelligent way to make your way in the world, but you know what? It has merit. It allows me to get on here and talk to you in a way that's comfortable and allows me to feel prepared like I'm doing my job. So I'll probably, until the day they put me in the ground, be paying $11 a month for America Online. There. That's my dirty little internet secret. Other people have, like, subscriptions to porn sites. My biggest, most embarrassing secret when it comes to the world of the internet is that I pay for America Online. There you go. Where? Yeah. You know, you could probably still email me funkman at hotmail.com. Oh, really? Uh, Would you still get it? No. I think like Yahoo, like Yahoo email addresses, like 500 million of them got hacked. And I think the way Yahoo email addresses, the folks over at Yahoo knew that there was some sort of like, uh, there was some sort of malicious spyware situation going on within Yahoo. It was like, they're like, hey, people are using their Yahoo email addresses. That hasn't happened in a very long time. We got hacked. <laughs> uh, 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 did you watch the debates last night? Did you? Was that a thing for you? Did you? Did you watch? I. You know what? I declared my independence from the debates, and and you know I followed a little bit of what was going on. There's so many ways to keep track of things now. I, I follow what was going on on Twitter and uh, during commercials of the baseball game that I was watching. The incredibly beautiful and emotional baseball game between the New York Mets and the Marlins. 
uh, the first game they played against each other, the first game the Marlins had played since losing the great Jose Fernandez. I, I did do a little bit of switching over. Man, hold, did, can we just stop for a second and talk about that game? Did, did you see it at all, Funkhauser? No, no. Uh-uh. Oh, my gosh. It was... It was... Oh, it was one of those things where it's it's just like... I never thought I would be happy to see a home run hit against my beloved New York Mets. But when D. Gordon launched one to the heavens, a walk-up home run, it was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. Where the left and right come together for fundamental truths. AD on the radio, on Twitter at ADSXE. So, yeah, I did not, as it turns out, did not watch the debates last night. Not really. Why? Well, something that was. Bigger than baseball happened. Something that was bigger than baseball happened, and that was that was the fact that the Miami Marlins played their first game against my beloved New York Mets since the passing of Jose Fernandez. I don't know how into baseball you are or you aren't, but Jose Jose Fernandez was one of those players that you wish your team had. Completely dominant pitcher who did so much for the Marlins with his attitude alone. He had this boyish enthusiasm for playing baseball, which, ah, whether he was unloading on your team and you were distraught by his immeasurable amounts of skill, or whether he was just hanging out, cutting up in the dugout, it reminded us all why we fell in love with the sport in the first place. And not only that, not only that, this was a guy who came to America, tried to come to America from his native Cuba multiple times, got thrown in prison, I think, when he was 14 years old for trying to come to America so he could pursue his dream of playing professional baseball. Underwent so much to live in this country. I think he was, I don't know how old he was, but he was on a boat coming from Cuba to America. And his mother, his beloved mother fell overboard. He saved her life, jumped into the water, rescued her, and they got to America. And against all odds, against all odds, thrown in jail at 14, saved his mother from drowning while coming to America. Against all odds. He comes to America. He goes to high school. He gets to be extremely good at baseball, and he launches a glittering career, an all-star rookie of the year. And Gary Cohen, who is, if you're not a Mets fan, who's the Mets guy on SNY TV, said something beautiful and incredibly poignant about the national anthem and what it meant on that particular day. I was especially struck by the poignancy of the national anthem, a song we hear every day. But for a young man who risked everything to be a part of this country, it rang especially true today. You know, it's um, just... And that was a real reminder of what it is to be American and the privilege that we have of being American here in this country. And so I watched that. I watched that instead of paying very close attention to the debates. Why? Well, look. I mean, I went into it thinking, probably have your mind made up at this stage in the game. I don't really think that anyone's changing their mind. I don't think anybody is flipping up their vote based on the presidential debates from here on in. Kimmel had a good point. Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton in the first of three presidential debates. It was a long 90 minutes, but the results are in, and not a single voter changed their mind. So, a huge waste of time. 
I, it's very hard to believe that there are still undecided voters out. The choice is pretty orange and white. It's not... <laughs> This was expected to be the most watched debate ever. The ratings uh, were expected to rank up with the finale of Cheers, with the finale of Match, for real. Which makes sense if you think about it, because in a way, this election kind of feels like the series finale of America. And they, uh, I of- so yeah, I gave it the big old misseroo. And I was thinking about it. I was like, this is my job. I work in talk radio. I really need to be up on this. And I was like, no. Look, one thing that you're going to hear from me over and over again on this show that you won't hear on any other talk shows is, I don't know. There's this desire to be omnipotent. There's this desire to know absolutely everything, or at least to appear as though you know absolutely everything. And it's always been the case with talking heads like me, and it's more and more the case in the world at large. Everybody plays gotcha with each other. Oh, well, of course you know about this, don't you? And then you fall into the trap and go, oh, that? Well, this is what I think of that. And like, ha ha, that doesn't exist. I gotcha. A buddy of mine once said to me, I was on the phone with him, and uh, he lives in Los Angeles, and he was like, I got to go. I'm going out to dinner. I was like, oh, cool. Have a great night. Where are you going? And he was like, you don't know restaurants in Los Angeles. And... I was like, well, I know some. I, I've, I've been to Los Angeles. I've eaten at restaurants. I was just curious where you're going. He's like, fine, I'm going to uh, Affidavit's Bar and Grill. I was like, oh, you're right. I don't know that one. And he was like, wow, that's very impressive. I was like, what do you mean that's very impressive? He was like, I made that up to test you. Most people would have been like, oh, Affidavit's, yeah. <laughs> I really, really love the uh, ceviche there. It's good stuff. <laughs> But you were honest. You said you didn't know. I kind of respect you now for that. I was like, I respect you a little less for testing me in that way, but I get where you're going with it. And so you're going to hear me say something that not a lot of talk radio people say on this show, which is, I don't know. You can't know everything. And if you pretend to know everything, you're a liar and you're boring. And you're never going to learn anything. So I made a conscious decision to declare my independence from the debates last night. And watch them, don't watch them. But when it comes to declaring your personal independence from everything that's going on in the world right now, there's a very good reason as to why you should. And we'll get into that next. Also, Robert Trujillo from Metallica is on the show today. Yay! Don't get the blues, get all the news. We need all of you guys out there in Radio Land. All aboard! He's back. AD on the radio. Give it up, yeah. Give it up, yeah. Bring this on, bring this on. Come on, come on. So the world is changing, my friend, and it's changing rapidly. Things are different today than they were yesterday, and they're going to be different tomorrow. I think one of the most incredible paradigm shifts that's come into existence over the last five years or so is the ability for people to make money based on their skill and their skill alone or their resources and their resources alone. Digital technology has provided a conduit for anyone who wants work to go get it. At least more and more. For example, you wanted to, you wanted to make money driving people around? You needed... At least, in this, at least in Manhattan, man, you needed one of those badges. You needed a cab driver medallion. And for those that don't know, a cab driver medallion is something equivalent to the cost of your home. You got to get a mortgage on it. I think it's like four or $500,000. Don't quote me on that, but it ain't cheap. And if you wanted to make money shuttling people around, you had to make that kind of investment in yourself, in your car, in your business, all the above. Now, my libertarian friends would tell me that My libertarian friends would tell me that government is when they take one of your rights away and then sell it back to you. I have a car. I want to drive people around. That should be allowed. I have a car. They have money. They need to get somewhere. I'm providing a service. That should be the end of it. No, no. You need need a license. You need uh, this thing that's going to cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then, and only then, will we let you take a car and drive somebody around and accept money for it. And look, in some places, in some places, they're having a harder time getting this to catch on than others. But 
It is the way of the future. It is fiscal independence is what it is. You're out of work. You have a car. You can drive for Uber or Lyft or whatever new ride-sharing service pops up next week. The point is people are now in more control of their lives than they ever have been before. In many ways, it feels like we're absolutely spinning out in a reckless and hopeless way. But you got more power and more control and more influence over your life in this day and age than you ever have before in the past. That my mechanic thing, if you're an out-of-work mechanic or just a mechanic that wants to work on the weekends, it'll let you go, hey, here's a guy with some skills. I need my brake pads changed and new tires, and he's going to come to my house. Well, it's convenient for me. I don't have to go anywhere. He's just going to do it. It's going to be awesome. Airbnb. You got a room to rent? Well, you lose your job, but you have a room. There's financial hope for you. You can go out and get stuff done. And every week from here on in, there's going to be new versions of this popping up. New ways that the paradigm has shifted to give people that have ability, skills, or resources a way to make money off of them. And it represents independence, and not only independence financially, but independence of thought. Now, are you going to be able to buy yourself a mansion and retire based on what you make driving a couple of hours a day for Lyft or Uber? No, probably not. But nevertheless, it is just the very tip of an iceberg that looms large underneath a vast body of water. And we can only begin to speculate where it's going. But one thing I can tell you for sure is that we are entering an age of greater independence than ever before. And Funkhauser and I have been talking about this a little bit on the show, saying, hey, we should we should get some some young kids on. We should get some millennials on. People that are fresh out of high school or fresh out of college and get their take on politics, get their take on their view of the world as we approach the election. And I think that's important. And you're going to say, well, kids will say, I don't know. I don't care. It makes no difference to me. And the knee jerk crotchety old reaction to that is to go, huh, these kids are so irresponsible. What are we going to do about these kids? If this is the future, I weep for it. And look, there is a certain amount of cloth-headedness that goes hand-in-hand with youth. But I think there's a very important lesson in all that for all of us. Do you remember when you were 19, 20, 21, 18? Not quite an adult, but no longer a child making your way in the world. You had grand plans, designs, schemes, ways you were going to conquer the world, ways you were going to go out and make this world your bitch. And you probably didn't care. Unless you were one of those precocious, intellectual, political types that chose to study it in college or or for some reason got meaning from it very early on, you probably didn't care too much about politics. You probably didn't care too much about voting when you were a teenager, when you were 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. And then what happened? Life didn't fall in line the way you hoped it would, because it never does. And I'm not saying you. But I'm saying a lot of us start caring about politics, start caring about the effect that an elected official has on our lives, start caring about these things when life doesn't fall into line the way you hoped it would. When you do not make the world your bitch by the time you're 22, when you have problems making rent, when uh, a relationship comes along, I want to buy a house. I can't afford to buy a house. I've got a kid. I'm struggling to feed this kid. I can't afford to buy a house. I'm paying taxes, and all of a sudden, life isn't working out, and there's more month at the end of the money instead of more money at the end of the month, and I need someone to blame for this. I'm going to call my congressman. This is who I'm voting for. Now I care about politics because life didn't fall into line the way you were expecting it to. And the independence of thought that you had when you were 18 years old, think how powerful it would be if you could adopt it now as an adult, as a grown-up. If you could just recognize, hey, 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 all this stuff that's going on makes no difference to me. I'm just going to figure out how to make my world my bitch. I'm going to figure out how to bring this world to its knees. I'm going to shake out of this life what I want. I'm equipped. I'm smart enough. Why are we running around chasing politicians, trying to cling on to this vague joke of an idea that they're going to make any difference in our daily lives when we wake up in the morning? Hillary, Trump, you think they're going to make a difference the day after they're in office to your daily existence? Chances are they're not. 
People say that one candidate or another means instant and global Armageddon. We're all going to hell in a handbasket. And look, things change, things move, things evolve, disasters happen, financial, natural, political disasters. All these things happen, and eventually the world writes itself. And there is a correction. There's a market correction. There's a natural correction. There is a leveling off of all things. And it's horrible to be caught up in the middle of it before things level off. People that were caught up in the financial disasters of 2006, 7, and 8 that lost homes, lost families, lost everything, lost jobs, some cases lost life because they gave up on it. It's horrible to be caught up in the middle of those things. And if you are caught up in the middle of one of those things, I hear you, I feel you, I understand you. But here's the thing. You can either wait for the market to correct itself, for nature to correct itself, for a president that you think is a criminal to be impeached, or you can get on with your life. And that is why I chose to watch baseball last night instead of the debates. I stopped and I thought, what difference is it going to make? Was there a clear and decisive winner? A lot of people say Hillary wiped the floor with Donald Trump. I'm not so sure. All my Donald Trump friends think that, you know, ah, you can't really count that as a victory for Clinton. Really, it was a victory for Trump. It's twisted by the media. Like, my point is, nothing was resolved by this debate. You can count points. You can say there's a clear winner. But like Kimmel said, a lot of people not really changing their minds at this stage in the game. I don't know if you're changing your mind. I can't imagine that you were. People seem pretty fixed and pretty pretty resolute when I talk to them. So, I would advise you to declare your independence. Independence from a process that seeks to use you and mire you down in the careers of politicians that ultimately aren't the ones that are going to make a difference in your life. That, as we've said so many times on this show, falls to you. It will always fall to you. And there is tremendous power in realizing that. Independence is happiness. Susan B. Anthony. All righty then, Funkhauser. How much time do we have to kill before uh, before we talk to Robert Trujillo, Trujillo of Metallica? Oh, man. Carry the two plus five. A ah, good ten here. A little bit here okay. and a little bit later. A little bit here, we'll a little see. bit later. Do I mean, have... the the uh, the food plate just showed up. So, oh, oh, did we mm. tell him it was going to be on the phone? I'm not. Oh, uh, <laughs> well, I don't know, but I'm uh, I'm going to be eating uh, Robert Trujillo's canapes. <laughs> uh, Metallica have a new album out in November. They just dropped another song from it, "Moth into Flame." How is it? How. Oh, so good. So good. I've been programming a radio station for about three years now. And in that time, things have... Oh, wait. Hold on. <laughs> so good. Oh. Yeah. So good. So good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can you do Lars or can we just both do James? I could just do that. Yeah. 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 Ever, yeah. Ever, since, ever since we had Jim Brewer on the show, I realized I can't do an impersonation of James Hetfield from Metallica, but I can do an impersonation of Jim Brewer doing an impersonation <laughs> of James Hetfield from Metallica. Like, ooh. until I, ooh, yeah. And, like, his impersonation of Lars, oh, I'm really happy to tell you that we're going to have a new Metallica album out right in time for Christmas. You'll be waiting under the tree when you wake up Christmas morning if you buy it on November 18th when it's coming out. Is that a good Lars? Yeah, I don't that know. is. I think that, that is. is. Oh, it's really? Good enough. Cool. Yeah. Uh, good for me. Yeah! Um, so- <laughs> Just tell me to stay off Napster and we've got it. <laughs> Beer! Good! Napster! Bad! <laughs> Do you remember the Camp Chaos, that first viral video ever? Like, we can't play it. The language on it, it will get us fired immediately. But 
uh, it, it's genius. I'll, I'll put it up on uh, on the old bloggy blog, or I'll tweet it out. But yeah, we're excited to have James Hetfield from. Uh, we're excited to have Robert Trujillo from Metallica we're, on the show as part of our punk rock politics interview series. This is kind of like a cool thing. Like when we're trying to get guests on the show now, um, you know, like what I, I don't know if we have time for that. Really, Metallica did it. Like it kind of takes care of a lot of different things. I'm very, very excited about this. But yeah, we look forward to talking to Robert Trujillo of Metallica in just a little bit. I had something I was going to say. I felt like the last 10 minutes were just that, like sparkling wit, brilliance, and yeah. all tied together. And now I, I there honestly. There goes the plane crashing like, now. Yeah, I was just like, I had something I was going to say. Now I can't remember what it was. It's not a good quality for a talk radio host to have. Uh, oh, yeah. No, what I was going to say was like Metallica's new song, Hardwired, and not the one you heard, but the, I've been programming a, a rock radio station for the past three years, and lots of music has come and gone in that time that I've liked, that I've gone, hey, this is cool, that I've gone, hey, I think this will really mean something to our listeners, and we're just trying to give them what they want, so yeah, we're, we're playing it. The new Metallica song, Hardwired, was the first thing in three years that hit me, and elicited a real visceral response like i had goosebumps and i noticed at the end of the song after i listened to it the first time i was out of breath and i realized it was because i was holding my breath during certain parts of the song going oh god what's gonna happen next it's it's uh, very very excited about the new metallica album i think they've gotten it right i think this is the the best thing that they've done in 20 plus years and i'm really really stoked to talk to robert trujillo in just a little bit about that and what he makes of the state of the world at the moment right now though let's take a look at the events of the world (laughs) with me again i forgot what i was gonna say oh yeah with with super producer to the stars barry funkhauser this is my witness news in no way, shape, or form fair and certainly not balanced. And now, super producer to the stars, Barry Funkhauser. Barry Funkhauser. Who? Barry Funkhauser. What? Yeah. Barry yeah. Yeah. Funkhauser. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Go over to James Hetfield's house for a barbecue. Take a right at the light. Never gets old. Not to me. Oh, wait a second. We're supposed to. Do we have when we come back. Any... When we come back, we'll do news. Yeah. What's the first headline? Donald Trump. What about him? Uh, he claims that this is the worst time ever for black people in America. What? Well, it sounds like we should talk about that. And we'll do it next. It means it's not how you use it. You gave it a shot. You tried your best. Your best to suck without enough. So hang it up. Just give it up. It's time somebody lets you know that you will never be good enough. You will never be one of us. You will never. More AD on the radio. All right, then, Funkhauser. Let's get a little time before uh, before Robert Trujillo of Metallica checks in as part of our punk rock politics interview segment. What's going on? Well, Donald Trump claims this is the worst time ever for black people in America. Yeah. Now, look, here's the thing about me and Funkhauser. Full disclosure, you might not have been able to tell from our the way we go through life, but we are white. We're incredibly, incredibly white. And I, for one, do not have the hubris or the short-sightedness to speak to the experience of anyone in America but white peoples. If you're white and male in America, let's be real here, you won the genetic lottery, so far be it from me to make assumptions about anybody else's experiences. But I can say that no matter what the results are of the upcoming election, I hope that they bring us closer to a time when all of us in America are all equal in all things. And I guess I'm guessing it's going to come up over and over again over the next couple of presidential debates before the election. Donald Trump said it's the worst time ever for black people in America. On the other hand, he is living proof that there's never been a better time to be orange. Go on. What else? Uh, last night was the first presidential debate between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Round uh, one. Who do you th- Fight. Who, who, do you th- who do you think the winner was, Funkhauser? I don't know. I don't think there was one. I think I there's mean, just a bunch of losers. They're called the American people. 
Oh, ooh, provocative, Funkhauser. You just said a, you just said a thing. Wow, I did. Yeah, good for you. Uh, <laughs> go on. Uh, people across the country agree that there was a clear winner. Mm, yeah, the terrorists. What else? <laughs> Some pundits say Donald Trump didn't seem prepared. Are we a pundit? I don't know what a I think pundit we're is. What is a pundit? Uh, we're, we just have opinions. That... We opine about things. Mm. Political punditry. It's Look, anytime you get something that's huge, huge, uh, all sorts of third party things will spring up around it as a way to make money, like politics. Uh, there's now people that um, make money just by talking about politics. They're not in politics. They're not political. They don't run for office. They're not on the field playing the game. They just talk about it. Same could be said for sports. Same could be said for Pokemon. You know, all those devices that have sprung up, like that one, well, what is that phone case that has a little indentation in the front cover and you flip it over and it ho- helps you aim Pokeballs better? You know that thing? Uh, Maybe, no. Yeah, well, it, it sprung up almost immediately. Anytime there's something that captures the public imagination, lots of people spring up all over the place. Oh, yeah, I got me a Pokey uh, glove. Yeah, see? Third-party applications to help make money off of it, and that's what political punditry is. People that have opinions and uh, share them for a living on uh, oh, what's going on. So I guess kind of, sort of, we might be considered pundits. It sounds a little bit too official. If we say we're political pundits, people go, <laughs> shut up. Let's pull that one over the side of the reality turnpike. You're not a pundit. But I, I guess that's kind of, sort of, technically speaking, what we are. And yeah, some pundits say Donald Trump didn't seem prepared, to which Donald Trump responded, Believe you me, something <laughs> like. <laughs> but here's the thing: Donald Trump's followers, his fans, don't want him. The people that are going to vote for him. Wow, this is where we are in America at the moment. We're referring to people that are going to cast their vote for someone as followers and fans. And I did it without even thinking about it. We're all left. But like Donald, the folks that are going to vote for Donald Trump, a lot of them like him not being prepared. They say that speaks to his level of realness, that he's off the cuff. They say once he started writing speeches and reading them off teleprompters when things or when things went pear-shaped for him for a second. And so if he's back to shooting from the hip, well, that's exactly what the people that are going to vote for him want. So there you go. So it doesn't really matter if he's prepared or not. I don't know when people are going to get it through their heads, but the laws and rules of politics and of conduct do not apply to Donald Trump in this election. And it's one of the things that has allowed him the ability to get as far as he had and to absolutely crush the competition. False. I just, I just want to be like him. False. No. 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 Like, Lies. the little bits of the debate that I saw, Wrong. the little bits of the debate that I saw, it wasn't like watching a political debate. And people are saying that Hillary won. I just, I, I felt like she was stammering and stuttering her way through the whole thing and Donald Trump kind of like housed her on a lot of stuff because he was just able to go, no, wrong, you're an idiot, it's your fault. It, it was like watching it was like watching an argument around the dinner table during Thanksgiving as opposed to any political debate that I'd ever seen. And like I would flip over occasionally when the baseball game was in commercials and be like "What? no, click back to something that, that, that does make a difference about how I, <laughs> and how I feel. Like, it, it's, okay. Go on. It's estimated that 100 million people watched last night's debate. Uh huh. Uh-huh. 100 million people. Million people. 100 million pundits. Uh, no, no, pundits. We're, we're pundits. Like, we're average consumers. But here's the thing everybody's a pundit now. Like, I just no no interest in going through my Facebook feed and hearing people or, or reading people. Uh, this is my take on what happened mm-hmm. last night. Don't care. Love you as a person. Don't care. Don't, don't. Uh, it's so insightful and thoughtful. Don't care. Don't care. And that's a horrible thing to, for me to say because does their opinion matter as much as I do? Are we all created equal? Are we all endowed with certain inalienable rights? Yeah, damn skippy we are. But I just, you know, here I am asking people to listen to me on the radio and actively going, I, do, I don't care to read on Facebook, what you have to say about. I, I don't care to read your Facebook summary of what happened during the debate last night. And is, is that fair? Is that wrong, Funkhauser? No, this is my job. I'm doing my job. And um, it's not like I don't care about their opinion or how they feel. I just don't care to spend my time reading it because literally everyone is. It, 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 the internet is deluged with things that make are very important to a lot of people, but make no difference to anyone else. It's really. It, 
when you're spouting off in, in that way online, I think you're just the digital equivalent of someone that wants to hear their own voice. You're not really trying to talk. You're trying to say, I have a voice. And you know what? This is part of the reason why Trump is so powerful in this day and age. It really is because people feel like they don't have a voice. They don't feel like they're heard. They don't feel like they are connected. They don't feel like they matter. And Donald Trump has tapped into that. All sorts of people right around the 2007-2008 financial disaster that were just honest, hardworking people that paid their taxes, that stimulated the economy. They saw people getting bailed out, allowed to keep homes that they had no business having on one end. And they saw banks getting bailed out, allowing to continue to exist in criminal and awful ways. And they went, hey, I've been passed over. I've been left behind. And you're so starved for attention and affection and the idea that anybody cares about you that a politician can come along and say, I care. And you go, yeah, yeah. There's something happening here. and You should know what it is. (laughs) The dumbing up of America. No, more AD on the radio. Hey, it's Robert Trujillo from Metallica Calling. Robert, what's up? It's AD. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Oh, yeah, man. I know we have all things Metallica to discuss today, but... A little while back, while you were working on Jocko the movie, you called to talk about it. And since then, hit Netflix a little while ago. I I probably watched it about four times, and I learned something new every single time. And uh, for those that haven't seen it yet, it's a gift to the world. And if music is important to you, even more so. So thank you so much on something I think is a triumph on every level. Well, thank you. Um, I mean, that means a lot to me because that was a six-year journey, a definite passion piece. Um, it was the hardest, most difficult thing I've ever taken on, and and, and but it was also probably the most re- rewarding. Mm-hmm. Um, doc films are uh, <laughs> they're very they're passion driven, and it's not about money. They don't make it. They don't make money. That's not why you do them. But um, I always feel that you know life stories are precious and they're important, and especially one like that, somebody who's really a musical genius and and uh an inspiration to so many players i mean geezer butler from black sabbath sent me an email about a month ago and he never emails me you know and he was <laughs> like well that's what you and i have in common because old geezer hasn't emailed me in a little while exactly. either exactly and he's like rub i just like and i and i and i can you know you read can, his email in his I, accent I don't can, you exactly rub i just want to say congratulations you know such an incredibly gifted, talented individual, yeah, not me, Jocko, and, and, and he says... <laughs> you as well. And, and such a sad demise, you know, it was like a narrator, I could hear his voice, and it was very short and sweet, and it meant a lot to me, and I actually sent him an email saying, well, you know, you and Jocko are my favorites, you yeah. know, and, and so it's an honor to, you know, to always uh, hear your words, and especially positive words. So anyway, yeah, I mean... Yeah, it, it you know, thank you. I really appreciate that, and I and I do highly recommend it. Just you know, not even just because I'm involved in it. I just think it's a, it's a really great film. Yeah, no. If music means anything at all to you, watch Jocko the movie on Netflix. Like I said, it's a it's a gift to the world. Uh, speaking of gifts to the world, he said, unsubtly changing gear. See how I did that? Um, Metallica is about to unleash yet another gift upon the world. Oh yeah. Man, first and foremost, it passed the goosebump test for me where I was like, oh, my God, this is so good. And then you watch phones light up and you you hear people go, this is amazing. And it really struck a nerve with a lot of people immediately. There's something about there's something about the breakdown, the middle part of hardwired that makes me want to destroy things in a way that is productive that my therapist would approve of. <laughs> feels like you really tapped into something right. that, you know, I hate to put labels on, on stuff, but the label that a lot of people seem to have assigned to it, like, great, Metallica made a thrash record again, this rules. Right. Well, you know, it, it, it's always going to be a journey. You know what I mean? Um, the thing that's so exciting for me is, uh, you know, I feel for me that my 
launch pad with Metallica was actually Death Magnetic. You know, that was a, a collaborative, you know, uh, experience for me with with Lars and James. And um, and then you know you get into the second phase of the journey, and it's you know it's got elements of that, but then it's kind of got other elements too. You know, mm-hmm. it, where it where it it is thrash, it is in your face. Maybe um, the dynamics are a little different. You know, than than a song like "Day That Never Comes" or whatever, which is a great song too. But it's a different experience. Um, the signature is always going to be there, and I know you know fans will always have an opinion, and they're always sort of going to be like, you know, but I want you know I want this or I want that or I, I you know you know Metallica sucks or what <laughs> now you know, <laughs> I, you know you get that all the time. I, I haven't heard that on this record. I think you guys have dodged that bullet this right. time. Metallica used to be good. You know, it's just it's, <laughs> you can't win them all. You know, but the 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 whole thing with that I find great about this band is we take chances. We, we, uh, like to challenge ourselves and, you know, we're, we're, uh, doing the best we can and to hopefully still have relevant music in this day and age. And it, it also, it, it's fitting with the times, you know what I mean? There's a lot of confusion out there. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people are, are, are losing it to a certain degree. So I think, uh, this is appropriate. It's therapeutic music. It is therapeutic music, and I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, I, I didn't want to force anybody to talk about anything they didn't want to, but since you opened that door, let's go there. America, the world, and the run-up to the election, it's weird. And I remember talking to you in the past, and you've said it feels like every single band that you've ever been in, when you join them, whether it was Metallica or when you are playing with Jerry Cantrell, you kind of seem to wind up in these situations where you're there at an emotional low point for all of them, and you've managed to be a voice of reason, a beacon of hope. Uh, you, know, you have an unbelievably positive attitude, and that just shines through. Right. What with you know the way the country's going over the last couple of years? I mean, I talk to people that have been around longer than me. I'm like, do you ever remember it feeling like this, this weird, this divided, this... And, right. and everyone said, no, 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 I haven't. Uh- I have yeah. not, and I have to assume some of that feeling had to seep into the Metallica record. Yeah, I, I for me, you know, I know um, that uh, creatively, you know, I tap into the energy that's around me, mm-hmm. and um, you know, one of the things that happens with that the the, 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 uh, the energy that you speak of, you know, your release is often going to be through your creativity and your music and your art and. Uh, um, and you channel it accordingly, you know, and you let the art and the music speak for the times. And uh, so that's the positive that you, you get out of these transitional moments. Um, you know, going back to what you said about being in situations and in my throughout my career, I mean, suicidal tendencies, it was, I, I don't call it a low point, but I call it a, um, um, a point where, <clears throat> you know, Band members might be losing their minds a little bit. Uh-huh. And there's tension. Uh-huh. And there's, um, um, you know, uh, I mean, I, re- I this is going to be funny. I re- my best friend in the band. I mean, Mike Muir was definitely always my best friend in the band. But Rocky George, who was a, there was the guitar player for Suicidal yeah. he's he he really got me in the band, and I've known him since junior high school. I mean, but at the same time, maybe because we knew each other so well sometimes we're at each other's throat and I remember being on stage watching Metallica we were on tour with Metallica Black Album Tour must have been I don't know 94 or something and um, you know he pushes me I don't know why he got a few drinks I push him back (laughs) he pushes me and it escalates to where we're fighting on stage rolling around and Metallica's playing like master of puppets or something (laughs) and 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 the guitars I had Fields guitars are like right there and I don't even care if I'm if if I knock Rocky into the guitars and I blow everything out it was just that kind of angst and energy in that camp because there was a lot of partying going on there was just that kind of you know being on the road for a year straight well the the way it struck me last time we spoke i was like gosh this guy is so emotionally intelligent he knows how to navigate the terrain and thinking about where america and the world is right now where do you think the new metallica album fits into that well again i think um you know for me it, it 
music is is a is a release. It it should be therapeutic. You know, I know there's certain types of music I listen. I like to listen to at certain sort of uh, moods. And um, what I find about the new record is is it's got the, the, the people that like that hard driven, um, no pun intended, but that hard sort of driven, hard wired, mm. uh, you know, state of mind. And, and I mean this in a productive way. I don't mean it in a negative, you know, and they can, they can release whatever frustrations they have through listening to, you know, a Metallica song, you know, that's hard wired, about. hard wired is a cathartic experience. I noticed at the end of it, I was, I was breathing heavily cause I've been holding my breath through, through certain points going, well, what's going to happen next? And like, you're right. I think Metallica is a cathartic physical therapeutic experience at American ease right now more than ever. <laughs> Metallica is an aerobic workout, you know. Yeah. It's like, it's like uh, it's uh, you know, think fitness, man. Yeah. It, it, you know, yeah. It, 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 I, you know, I'm also very proud of the production. I, uh, I, I love the drums and the bass on this. Um, I, I feel that, uh, you know, our producer Greg Fiddleman, who actually engineered um, Death Magnetic album, I always thought it'd be great. No disrespect to Rick Rubin because Rick was vital and super important in getting Lars and James to reconnect with the thrash roots mm -hmm. and um, um, kind of, you know, having someone like Rick guide them into that or help at least guide them into that, I think was super, super uh, important um, at the time. And, um, and then I also feel that just over the years, the challenges that we've taken as a band, you know, learning the Black Album top to bottom, you know, and, and going out and touring that and um, was really, really cool because there were some songs that had never been played live, like Struggle Within, um, you know, and, and um, there's, there's a challenge that you have as you get older as musicians. A lot of guys... A lot of bands sort of take the other route, you know, like, man, I ain't playing, you know, I'm not playing Dyer's Eve, or I'm not playing, you know, we, we, uh -huh. that's too, I don't want to die, you know, <laughs> like, way too physical, you know. We, we kind of go against the grain of that, not that we don't complain, or, you know, Lars, you know, doesn't say my arm's going to fall off, but I think that going through these experiences where, you know, Ride the Lightning in its entirety, even Kill Em All, you know, we, we did that a couple of years ago, um, right down to anesthesia pulling teeth which yeah. was was kind of crazy you know it was like oh by the way you know let's play this song and not me but Lars and it's like let's play the whole album you know and you've got like three days to do it things like you know those kind of challenges that drive you crazy you know um, they're they're good they, they, they make you better and I think the one thing about this new record too is there's a groove even though it's fast and there's a lot of that energy and there's twists and turns some of it feels um like there's this frantic journey it, it, i feel it's tight and i feel that there's a pocket there that um is important and we've sort of fallen into this groove as a rhythm section and as a band so um i'm excited i'm excited to, to play these songs live and um and hopefully blow people's minds. I, you know what? As a longtime Metallica fan, I have to say this: this hits me in a way that Metallica hit me when I was 16 years old and had a lot on my mind. And I think it's doing that for lots and lots of people. It's always an absolute pleasure to talk to you, even more so when it looks like we're on the verge of getting an absolutely amazing Metallica album. Thank you so much, Robert. Right on. All right, I appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me. Take care. Later, dude. Thanks. 